Hello, hello. This is my Imagination with the Healing Garden, and welcome to Philosophical Coffee. First, we're going to talk about strange shit my cat does. But before that, if you are new to my channel, this is actually my laboratory. Uh, I am a scientist who is a cartographer of the abstract world. Now, this cat. So he's not a lab cat. In fact, if you want him to sit on your lap, he's just not going to, unless and until you use the bathroom. It is the only time, instant lap cat. And it's just so fucking weird. Like, I'll go to the bathroom and suddenly he's like, oh, I gotta go. Well, you, you know, cat tradition. So he goes into the bathroom with me and it's the only time he's a lap cat. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, can we please do this somewhere else other than the toilet? And I think it's the geometric proportions of the toilet of the feet to the, so he's got this perfect platform. But then I'm sitting here like writing my article this morning and he's laying on my kitchen table. I'm on my kitchen table in my living room because I'm that kind of a person and he's lying on the kitchen table and, and he's carrying around the salt. He's carrying the salt, the salt. And we're not talking a little, like this thing is solid ceramic and, and look at this thing and he carries it. He'll like put it in his mouth and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And it just, it blows my mind that he can, we'll hear it tinkling throughout the day and we'll look over and it's like, He's carrying the salt. And it's just, he, I can't believe he can fit it in his mouth and has the neck, the, the neck to hold it. And like, oh, so it's so strange shit my cat does. All right. So I, I'm wanting to start like an Instagram account, The Philosopher's Cat. This is probably going to be in my future, The Philosopher's Cat. And, and it's going to be like pictures of midnight and spriggan, spriggan. Pictures of midnight and spring and just doing weird shit while I give philosophical my, my one-liners. So I want to talk about something I have never talked about. And I know it. It's in my head. But it's, it's something I never really sat down and voiced. And I realized this morning how important it is to say this. When I... Six months ago, I thought I was stupid. I thought I was really stupid. And then I healed. It was actually around, yeah, it was April. I thought I was really stupid. I, I knew I was clever, but I didn't really get it. I thought I was stupid. Yeah. Um, when I healed, it uncapped my intelligence and knowledge. Trauma suppresses intelligence. Trauma suppresses your intelligence. Trauma suppresses your genius. You've got a genius under all that trauma. You really do. And I did not, especially if you're neurodivergent or ADHD, oh yeah, you've got a genius under there. That's why you're neurodivergent ADHD It's because the trauma caps and suppresses all the genius. And that's why you shake. That's one of the reasons. I, I can give you the physics reasons, but that, that's it right there. And when I took the cap off as I healed, it unlocked, it, it allowed me finally to free my, my potential, like all of it came out. Well, potential energy. That's right. So it's potential energy. And when you are traumatized, your potential is capped. It is down. You cannot be a genius slash hyper intelligence and have trauma. They contradict each other. Trauma is all fear system. Intellect and genius is all logic. And they are, they contrast each other. This is something that is never talked about. This is something that a lot of people do not know. So I talk a lot about it. And, and it's, I noticed this morning, I'm like, wow, I talk about it. But I don't think I've ever actually told them. Like, by the way, the reason why I talk about it is because it is a symptom of the trauma healing. As in, the reason why I'm so smart is because the trauma healed. So we have this, oh, I can't save myself. I can't take care of myself. I can't do this. I'm incompetent because the trauma is there. So when the trauma comes off, your potential bursts and you find out you're a super genius. 
In fact, and this is really hard, there is, it's in ratio to. The smarter you are, the more abused you had to be to suppress that. And you start to measure, you can actually use your intelligence as a metric to see how smart you really were, how much abuse you endured. It is not a pleasant experience to discover this. It's, it's actually the hardest thing of all of my trauma healing. Because when you're all done with trauma healing, when you're all done with the healing, there's this cap that comes off. And then you you're, you get smarter and you get smarter and you get smarter fast. And suddenly you're, and you get to this point and you're going, oh my God, I'm, I'm smart. And then, then you get to this part and you're like, oh my God. And, and you realize that you're still holding back. And that's where you can feel the trauma at work holding you back. That's when I took on arrogance to cure the humility and it worked. And then boom, it got all the way over here. And I went, well, there it is. And there were steps to this process where I started to see in metric how abused I was because they had me thinking I was here, which means this is how much they had to abuse me. And you are the same way we all are because you cannot have trauma and intelligence in the same head. You can't. And the reason why so many of us who aren't healed yet struggle with our abilities and our skills and our capabilities and potential is because we're that traumatized, because we are that suppressed. And so over here, under trauma, when we conclude, oh, I can't do that, you actually might be correct. Under trauma, you can't, but you can heal. And when you heal, you find out what you actually can do. And it's something I've never actually, it, it's a conclusion. It's one of those logical deductions my, my, my cognitive core figured out. And it was like, oh, and it was a realization I had, but I never articulated it and translated it over for others. And I'm like, yeah, you guys need to know, by the way, trauma kills intelligence. It's still there, but it suppresses it. The, the number one thing that's going to get you free, that gets you away from your abusers, is intelligence. So your intelligence is a direct threat to your abusers. And they know this instinctively. They know this. So the first thing you have to know, I, and I said it, the first th thing that an abuser needs from you is your ignorance. Well, how do you get that? They, they make you think you're stupid. So they call you stupid. They tell you all your incompetence. So you think you're incompetent. So you are incompetent. I think, therefore I am, therefore I think. As me. I am, therefore I think, therefore I am, therefore I think. And the abuser takes off that first I am and just puts you in with I think, therefore I am, therefore I think. When you heal, you're putting the I am back. I am, therefore I think. You're putting the authority back with I. I like to say that. You're putting the authority. I know this is going to go over to my Canva account this morning. And I'm going to prep it for my thing. And it's it's absolutely, that's it. Oh, yeah. No, I love that one. Do, 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 do. Healing puts the authority back in the eye of I am. There you go. So it is, it, it, it really is this massive comprehension of just how much authority is part of I. It, it really, which is why I call it the I of I and then the you of I, because we're talking authority here. Now, flipping on over here. I want to talk about beliefs today. Oh, I'm going to talk about beliefs today. I'm going to talk a lot about beliefs today. So I wrote an article. Uh, the link is down below. And I do a thing. And doing the thing is one thing. Seeing what I see, doing what I'm doing is one thing. Translating it for others is a whole other creature. And I've been doing this thing for a while now, for about three weeks. And I, every night I practice this, I do it and I tighten it and I'm going, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to like zero in on this and get it better and better. 
and now I'm at a point where I am in full control over it and I'm doing my thing and I'm like, all right, I got this down. Last night was the first night I was able to finally put it into words. Thank God. Putting it into words is a whole nother creature. And basically, I discovered about three weeks ago that I have lucid dreaming. Now, we all have lucid dreaming. And I am 100% consciously aware when I lucid dream. I always wake up at 3 a.m. And I always slip into the state of lucid dreaming where I toggle between conscious awareness and the dream. And then my conscious awareness, who's consciously aware of everything going on, going, all right, we are dreaming. <laughs> I started to see things and I went, I know what I'm looking at. I know exactly what I'm looking at. All right, let's try and I'm going to translate this over. Today was the last night was the first night I finally had all the words for it. You know the magic school bus, how they go into chemistry and they say, that's what I do. I use lucid dreaming as a magic school bus. It's literally quantum or macro. Like I have a telescope or a microscope. Now, there's the telescope. Is there the telescope? The, the perspective is the telescope. And I can see the dimensions. But when you get inside the mind, now you're getting into quantum and macro. Same thing with okay, we're here and we're looking out into the world and you can see out there in astronomy with the Hubble telescope or the other one. I can't, the, the name's really long. It's like four names. And I'm like the other telescope, the, the one that's really, really better than Hubble. And then there's the telescope where you are looking down into the world of atoms and quarks. So that's quantum. That is macro or micro. Macro means even smaller than micro. So it's like, I think it goes micro, macro, quantum. I think that's what it is. Um, but then you have, when you look out, it's the telescope and looking out vast. So you have scientists who are looking out vast. Those are astronomers and those are physicists, astronomers, NASA. And then you've got people who are the scientists who are quantum. And they are looking down into the precise we're talking really fucking small. I go inside the abstract mind. So that's where I am. I'm in the third dimension. And I'm looking in the abstract mind. I would say that the, and just to clarify, the word dimension means depth. And first, second, third dimension is only accessible when you have a point, a location. So I'm in Brooklyn. That's first dimension. Just Brooklyn. You got one dimension, you got one depth, you got one location. It is 8:20 a.m. in Brooklyn. Two. Well, now you've got two dimensions. What's the third? A lot of people will sit there and point at the face, and I'm going, that doesn't make any fucking logical sense. Your face is not a location. Your face can still be in Brooklyn at 8:21 a.m. So how the fuck is the face 3D? There was, and I'll tell you what it is, because there's the art world, and my daughter's an artist, we were watching art videos last night, and we were talking about Renaissance men and the perspectives, and I cannot remember his name, he predated Da Vinci, not by much, he was in the same era as Da Vinci, and he was the one responsible for perspective, which is actually not perspective, what that is is point of view. Point of view is often mistaken for perspective, a lot. Furthermore, this concept of something being 3D versus written on paper is a whole different, that's something different. So what's going on is the word dimension is being used in three different definitions here. And which is fine, but for people who don't realize that there are three different definitions, they're merging them all into the same di dimension. And now it doesn't make sense because you're talking about something being, well, you need two points. Basically, in the area of location and coordinates in map making, you require two, preferably three, points of location. And if you have one point, you have one dimension. If you have two points, you have two dimensions. And if you have three points, you have three dimensions. We're also talking about dimensions in the sense of our location to the Big Bang. 
Big Bang is, well, that's time. Every time you measure, measure time, it's Big Bang and our relativity too. It is 100% relativity to the Big Bang. And now we're getting into Einstein's work. That's accurate. But we're still talking about time. Time is only the location to where you are now to the Big Bang. It is 8.22 a.m. at January 16th, 2024. That tells you precisely how far away from the Big Bang we are on planet Earth. These rule changes when you go out there. So, or you when you go in here. Time only exists in this dimension. So it's when you start looking at whether something is 3D or 1D on or 2D on a piece of paper, completely different than when you are talking about location. We really need another word for this. And this is what happened is somebody started using the same word. This is because somebody who used the word dimension did not study linguistics or logic. They clearly lacked logic and logistics or linguistics when they decided to you're using these words. Oh, they may have been a great physicist, but that did not mean they were a great logician or linguistic, and it shows. So now there's a lot of inconsistency between these three different types. And a lot of people, because they lack logic, are using and now merging the definitions into one. A 3D face does not tell you where the face is. It tells you the sculpture. And that's, and that's really it. Yes, it's still talking about depth, but it's talking about a different kind of depth than when you're talking about, let me put it to you this way. Dimension means definition. It also means depth. It also means location. And now you've got people who are going in using the word all over the place where they're, they're merging the words definition, depth, and location, claiming it's all 3D. Therefore, oh, we're in the third dimension going to the fourth dimension. That doesn't even make sense. What define the, de de define the dimensions? Well, you've got location, okay, and time. Where's the third dimension? No one has defined it. But everyone's claiming that we're leaving it going into the fourth. And everyone's claiming that the fourth dimension is time. We've already got time in the second dimension. What are you talking about? We're talking about the third, the 12 ethical perspectives. The 12 ethical perspectives are the third dimension. The abstract world is the third dimension. But because no one's mapped the third dimension, that's what I do, because no one has has any definition of the third dimension, the abstract world, no one realizes, nor are they taking it into account when they are applying it to all the math and the physics. So it doesn't make sense unless and until you take the abstract world, define it, and then plug it in. Now it makes sense. Now we have the third dimension perspective. The third dimension actually is the abstract world. So now, and because my work maps it and defines it, we now have location. Now we've got three points. For instance, it is, I'm in Brooklyn and it is 826 AM, January 16, 2024. And I happen to be in the second perspective of the U of I. So there is my coordinates. Now it's telling you precisely which part of the abstract world I am located in. So that all being said, when I started lucid dreaming. I realized that I was walking into the third dimension. And I realized that I was in the world of quantum and macro, basically taking this telescope and being able to microscope and being able to zoom in to the different parts of the subconscious mind. So the abstract world consists of the subconscious mind and mathematics, time, and money. Those are the three things that we pull 100% from the abstract world. Mental illness is accumulated here. Make believe imagination and fiction are all here. Imagination. This is the area that's allowed anything beyond this, and people are called crazy. Crazy or insane literally means illogical. If you take the word crazy and plug it in with the word logic, in fact, I was watching Supernatural the other day. I love this. And Dean was arguing with Sam about this. He goes, you're crazy. You're fucking crazy. It's illogical. Boom. He, he, in, in the middle of him calling him crazy, he switched it over to calling him illogical. Crazy means illogical. It means 
not applicable to my logical comprehension. That is all that crazy and insane means. It means your behavior is not matched up to my logical comprehension, vice versa. That is what crazy means. But if you don't know the logical comprehension behind an action, it's going to appear. It is without logical comprehension. That is what crazy means, without logical comprehension. One moment. I'm totally going to be putting this one down. I love this. Crazy means without logical comprehension. That's it. Technically, to uh, the observer. That is known to the abuser. So crazy means without logical comprehension that is known to the abuser, or I'm sorry, to the observer. That is crazy. Now, if you can define it and if you can clarify you're crazy, then, then it's sane. Then it's not illogical. This is why we assume mental illness equals crazy is because they are behaving without reason. They are behaving without logic. We also have, well, you're crying for no reason. No, we are always crying for reason. Maybe not a reason that you can understand or that you comprehend in the moment, but there is always a reason for crying. So stepping back and taking a look over all of that now. It is this pure understanding, this pure comprehension that once you define the reason, once you understand the reason, it sheds the light, it stops being crazy, and it makes sense. And, and that's that's really it. We have this abstract, ill-defined comprehension of what crazy, what we think it is. And it, it's it's absurd, literally. That is what we think the word means. It means absurd. And it's it's not. It means illogical. So once once you fill in the logic, suddenly crazy ceases to exist, which is precisely what my work does. It literally takes the crazy out of insanity because it provides the logical comprehension behind illogical actions or insanity or mental illness. Here, here's the logical comprehension of what's really going on. Oh, so you're not crazy. You are experiencing a lack of the first perspective, which is causing you to do ABC. Yeah, that's correct. But because we've lacked the third dimension prior to this, people have not been able to understand why they behave a certain way. So back to our magic school bus. So I'm sitting here lucid dreaming and I'm like zooming in. There's like this whole This is me assessing on how how personal I want to ah, fuck it, I'll just go. So my my partner, my relationship is real complicated. It's one of the reasons why it's it's very complicated. Uh, there was a breakup that wasn't a precise, clean, clear breakup. There was behavior that acts like X, but the words that are spoken are Y. And it's primarily because he's afraid of love, trauma. So he acts like X. He behaves like X. The only thing that's inconsistent is the Y. Now, I'm over here with my logical cognitive core going, processing this data, going, okay, he acts like X, he behaves like X, he tells me he wants X, but his words then do Y. And then I'm stuck trying to logically deduce what to do. So he'll say the words, I'm breaking up, we're done. But he won't say the words, we're done, it's I'm broken up. Okay, we're breaking up. But then nothing changes. And then I've got all of these behaviors over here. And then he's confirmed, I love you and I value you. And I'm going, okay, so what's the problem? He's got mental illnesses to work out. Okay, gotcha. So I take my vast knowledge of psychology. I take my vast knowledge of the abstract world. And I break it all down. I see where he is in his perspectives. I understand the overall, this is where he is. And I would summarize it as saying, this is someone who has some serious problems with his own self which he needs to work out. So he's gone on walkabout and he doesn't understand it. He cannot explain this. It's just observation. And then when I've asked him questions, his answers confirm my observations are correct. So it is based 100% off of logic. And then he'll withdraw and vanish, which is absolutely 100% predict predictable based off of the avoidant behavior. And here is why, ABC, laid it all out. 
and then two weeks will pass and I won't hear from him. This is very unusual for him. I always hear from him. But he told me this time ahead of time, hey, well, you're not going to hear from me. Okay. He's on walkabout. Now, it's very much like a sailor who decides I'm going to go to sea. Okay. Enjoy your voyage. I will be here when you get back. But is he going to come back? So now there's like all this stuff. So I've got my logical line. I've got my ethics and I've got my identity. And we're all arguing. There's cognitive dissonance. This is how I mapped out. This is why I mapped out. 100% of my work is actually coming from him. He is literally the catalyst to all of my work. He has his cognitive core. I have my cognitive core. And I don't understand what's going on over here. So I analyze it and figure it out over here. And then I have this massive epiphany and go, oh, my God. And then I map it out over here. This is all to understand my relationship. And then I'm over here and I'm going, okay, I comprehend this. And then I translate it and here I am on the podcast delivering it to you. And then as this relationship evolves, shifts and changes, I have more information that comes through. I analyze it over here and I go, ah, I see another breakthrough. Now, when we started doing this, I was really mentally ill and he was really mentally ill. And we both basically made the manifestation unknowingly of we just want to be in love without any mental illness. Boom, we're working on it. So I got this manifestation that was dropped like two and a half years ago where we both said, I just want to be in love with you and without any mental illness. And then slowly I started to watch this arc occur where I got healthier. And now I'm here and I'm done with my healing. And then around here, he started healing, Twin Flames. So around here, he started healing. And I'm going, oh, well, based off of the logical curve, based off of my own healing and now his, which I was not anticipating, uh, suddenly it's, 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 it's all coming. So I'm seeing this arc where it does this. And I am here in the arc. Therefore, logically producing, we're going to be meeting back here. So I can, and I can see the future with all of us, with us here, healed and everything's all great. But the reality is here. Now I'm observing this. So my logical data is putting all in. Identity is going, I want to go here. I love him. Okay, great identity. We got that. So intuition's going, all right, in order to get what she wants, you need to move here. You need to move here when you need to do this here. Okay, thank you. Intuition, check. Ethics is going, but it has to be ethical. Thank you, ethics. Yes, it has to be ethical. And logic is sitting there going, and logical. Yes, yes, it has to be logical. But then beliefs comes along and goes, I don't think he's coming back. We need to shut this down. Abandon him now. Ab what the fuck? So last night, and I noticed that my mental health was taking a turn where I was emotionally distraught. I was emotionally suffering. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to step back and take a look at this. Why? Because because if I'm mentally suffering now, that, that's, that's a red flag. So I sat down with identity, and I knew that mental duress comes from cognitive dissonance. So I sat down, and I looked at cognitive dissonance, and I'm like, all right, where's the cognitive dissonance coming from? This is not rocket science. This is, <laughs> this is not rocket science. This is metaphysical science. So I sat down, and I went, all right, identity. Identity, what do you want? And this is how this is done. This is going to be a worksheet. In fact, I'm going to do the worksheet right now. We're going to go ahead and do a worksheet. How do you guys want this? Do you want a PDF? Do we want a PDF that's printable? I'm going to put this on a Google Doc for now, I think. And then I will figure out how I'm going to give it to you guys later because I don't know how to do this. So the first question to ask is, what does identity want? This is, this is the first question. She has to define it. She is in charge. I am literally composing you guys a worksheet that you can download and fill out for yourself so you can figure out these questions for yourself. So I'm going to start creating worksheets while I work. So what does identity want? That is the very first question. Once you define, you must define what identity wants. You must define what identity wants. She is in charge. That's what I learned last night is that she has the authority. I thought logic had the authority because this is my brain and I'm going, oh, logic is in charge. And my brain with my logic goes, oh, yes, that's right. I am in charge. Apparently, identity is not OK with that because she's in charge. So then I asked the question, what are my ethics? Now, I have access to the 12 ethical stages of growth. I know what my ethics are. My ethics are second perspective of the U of I. So there they are defined. Now you can access the 12 ethics. I'm going to go ahead and put this. 
available on my website. And I will have a link available so you guys can go and you can see where your ethics are. Once you've defined your ethics, you now know, okay, these are my ethics and this is what identity wants. Now, the next question is, what is logical? It must have a defined logic. If you do not know what is logical for you, it's not going to work. It's going to be a very, very specific, yeah, no, no, no. It has to be logical. Now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, that doesn't matter for me. <laughs> but it does. Yes, it does. There is so much logic in your brain, and that's the problem. You are in pain because you have cognitive dissonance, which means something's not logical. Cognitive dissonance is illogic. Had psychologists studied logic, they would know that. Had psychologists studied philosophy, they would know that. Cognitive dissonance is illogic. That's all it is. It is illogic. And 100% of your emotional pain is based off of illogic. Oh, you're logical. So it has to be logical. You want to resolve your pain? Become logical. Bottom line. So cognitive dissonance. What is logical? What do you believe? That's the next question. What do you believe? Now, that's the question. That's, that's really it right there. Because what you believe... And then it's, um, and what you believe does very much tie in with what your name is. The name is what you call yourself is the summation. It's important if you're calling yourself a name. If you're calling yourself stupid, it's important because that is now, like, it's the, what is your label? And I'm going to put here, what are, what are your labels or names? Because if you do have a toxic label for yourself, mine was sewer slut. True story. So that was in my brain. That was the summation of who I was until I found now, now it's Captain Princess and your majesty. Now it's goddess imagination. That's my name now. That's my name now. But good fucking God, did it take work to get here. So what is the one name? If you were to summarize all of you, what name comes out? And this is a good metric for telling you and showing you where your mental health is. It's a great meter to start, but it's not the be all end all. It's just the one that tells you, oh, I got work to do. The last one is therefore. And now we have your perspective. This is how perspectives are made. Now, when I look at all this, you have your, what you want, you have your wants, you have your ethics, you have your logic, you have your beliefs. When you look at these four elements, this is vital. This is what determines for you if there's cognitive dissonance. Okay. There's also, there's also, let me go back to, let me go back to this. There is also what is the actual reality. Uh, I hate to say it. Uh, what is this world? The material reality. What is the material reality? Instead of reality, it's what is the material versus the abstract reality. So that's your abstract reality. Oh, I got words here. Yeah. Yeah. So you have your abstract reality and your material reality. Your material reality is what is around you, your actual environment, your physical. And I'm going to put here your physical reality. Okay. And then you have your abstract reality and that's your subconscious mind. When they don't match, you have cognitive dissonance. Whatever abstract reality is in your head has to be materialized, has to be materialized. It, it, it has to be. And that's really it. Whatever your abstract, I'm going to say your defined abstract, whatever your defined abstract reality is, has to 
be reflected in your material reality. In your physical, I'm going to say physical, I like physical reality better, physical reality. So you have your defined abstract reality and your physical reality. If they do not coexist, if they conflict, oh, <laughs> you're going to have a mental illness. You're going to have cognitive dissonance. You're going to. This is why some people are perfectly happy in the second perspective is because the second perspective is their abstract reality and their material reality. So they're happy being second perspectives. They're never going to get out of there because there's no reason to. They are happy as second perspectives and they are second perspectives. You get into the third and fourth perspective. I don't think anyone's happy in the third perspective. I really, the third perspective is painful. The, the sixth perspective is painful, which right there is incentive to get the fuck out of Dodge. The fourth perspective, some people are fourth perspective reality and fourth perspective abstract. My father is fourth perspective material and fourth perspective abstract. He's not moving. He is not moving. He's there for the rest of his life. He has no incentive to move. He is happy there. So he is very much fourth perspective abstract and fourth perspective physical. And he's got it. He's, he's happy. He can't understand why everybody else isn't there. Welcome to fourth perspective. Actually, a lot of us, all of us are that way. That, that is all of us. Whenever perspective we're in and we're happy and we're aligned, we can't understand why other people. It's the alignment that makes us happy. It's the alignment that makes you happy. Happy is alignment. And that, that's it exactly. Now, I, I am a grower. I am a grower. You are either a grower or you are a comfort. You either comfort or grow. And, and that's it. I am a grower. So I am, I have to have, I, I know there's going to be change. I have to be open to change. And if I'm not, ooh, and I'm a Taurus, so that's going to be a bitch for me, but all right. So growing, a growers are, I want to be in the next one. I, I, I can't be here for very long. I, I feel stagnant if I'm not growing. So for me, my happy place is the growth. That's really, your happy place can be the perspective you want to be in, or it's as long as you're growing. And, and that's it. So if you're a sixth person, no one's going to be happy. No one's happy in the sixth perspective. No one is happy in the sixth perspective. It's painful. Can you be in the sixth perspective? And no, 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 no. There's, there's just no. I've yet to see it. And all my research, if you are in a sixth perspective, your goal is to get out of the sixth perspective because it's fucking painful. Now, fifth perspectives are cozy. Fifth perspectives are solid. They're like, oh, I'm in the fifth perspective and I am happy to be in the fifth perspective. The people who are not happy to be in the fifth perspective are people who are not fifth perspective. So this is all about alignment. Your abstract world, your abstract reality has to match your material reality. Has to. And if it does not, you're going to have cognitive dissonance. But the problem is, People do not know that there is an abstract reality. And people do not know how to define it. And people do not know how to manage it. And people know nothing about it. And it's my work. So when you realize what your abstract reality is, then it's work to, okay, now I need to make sure that my abstract reality matches my physical reality. The physical reality is a consequence to the abstract reality. The physical Reality is a consequence to the abstract. You manifest it. You have concept. I talked about this the other day. And that leads to the defined abstract imagination, which becomes the reality, the material reality. And, and that is it. It's concept, defined, abstract, material reality. Guess who designs concept? Well, that would be identity. Identity is the one who insists on the concept. All concepts come from identity. She is in charge of concept. So identity wants, there's your concept. Defined abstract, well, now you're into the cognitive core. And then your material reality is what is. So you have a what is, but is it matching your cognitive core? And is that aligned with what identity wants, the self? It all starts with the self and what she wants. Oh, my God, we are all her little bitches. 
the identity is your inner child. Your identity is what she wants. And she has to have the freedom to get what she wants. Freedom. I was watching um, Truman Show last night. I love the Truman Show. And it's, uh, first of all, I got to say, Philip Glass. Oh my God. Philip Glass is a classical composer. He is the inventor of something called minimalism. There's classical music, the umbrella, which is bullshit because classical music is actually the classical era, which is Mozart. Beethoven is not classical music. Thank you very much. Beethoven is romantic music. That's the romantic era. Bach is not classical music. Bach is the Renaissance. So you have Renaissance and then you have, oh, I just put, you know, so you have Bach and then you have Mozart and then you have Beethoven. And then you have Tchaikovsky. This is my era. This is my, I love romantic music. Oh my God. The, oh my God. Okay. I'm going to get off that. So 19, oh, what is it? 2024, Philip Glass. He's a classical music composer, but he's a classical music composer who lives today. So Philip Glass did the music, did the soundtrack to uh, The Truman Show. Um, I know him from Lincoln Center and in the musical world. So when I found out he was doing the soundtrack for The Truman Show, I was like, oh my God. So I was the one who went to that movie for Philip Glass. I was like, oh my God, I am here for Philip Glass. Oh my God, I love his work. Love his work so much. Oh, wow, that soundtrack. So it's at the end. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie yet. And Truman is sailing and he gets to the end and he's up against the wall. This movie is the pursuit of freedom. It is a pursuit of a man's freedom. And it's the, I know something's up. I know I am not in control. I know in control, freedom and in control. Oh, wow. See, we talk about, oh, it's all about control. It's all about control. It's all about freedom. Control comes as a result of freedom. Authority is how we exercise our freedom. And guess who's in charge of all that jazz? Identity. Freedom is the measure of our control. Walking around to say, everything is about control. It's how we control. It's how we could, guys, guys, can we use the right word? Because that's, that's, the creation of, the child of, the source. The source is freedom. Every time we talk about, I need to feel in control. No, honey, you need freedom. That's what you need. You don't get control unless you have freedom. But that's the word we're not saying. And because we're not saying it, we don't know to pursue it. And we don't realize we're slaves because we have a bunch of propaganda going, this is a free country. No, it's not. If it were, we would not have so many control issues in our society. We have the control issues we have because it's not a free country, because we're not in control, because we're not free. You think you're free? Try to leave. Take it from somebody who knows. Do you think you're free? Try and exit. You'll see just how free you aren't. That being said, in the Truman Show, he wanted to leave and he couldn't. He tried all the obstacles. You always can measure your freedom based on how easy it is to leave. Only a free man has the ability to just leave. So he tries to leave. The whole movie is him trying to leave. The whole fucking movie is Truman trying to leave. There's always an obstacle. Yeah, because he's not free. So he gets to the end. He's in his boat. He had to do this massive Houdini act. He had to disappear and vanish just to get around his encaptors. He's in the boat. He gets to the end. Suddenly he hits this wall. He gets off the wall or he gets, he gets off the boat and Philip Glass's music just consumes the, the film. And Jim Carrey is just pounding on the wall, crying. I can relate. <laughs> Good God, can I relate? 
And I said, no movie, not even Braveheart, captures our need to be free more than that moment in that movie. Just sheer free me. And he's banging on that wall. And he sees the staircase and he starts to follow and he gets to the staircase and he sees the door that says exit. Freedom. It's all it comes down to. And Kristoff, the director of the Truman Show, comes on the air and he addresses him. And I'm just like, oh, my brain was just psychoanalyzing this thing crazy last night. And he's like, I'm the director of the greatest TV show and you are the star. There's lies and deceit here and there's lies and deceit out there. I'm not giving you anything that isn't already out there. Except freedom. That's the only difference. Freedom. And he said, I've been watching you your whole life. He makes the plea. He's begging him to stay. Freedom. And Truman says, you never had a camera in my head. And he says, hey, you know, this is awesome. Say something. And the way Jim delivers this is just breathtaking. It's a big <laughs> freedom. Fuck you. And he walks through the door. He takes his final bow and he's like, freedom. Fucking gorgeous. And the most beautiful thing about this film is there's only one person in the entire film who says the word free. And that's Sylvia. She's the only character in the entire show that uses the word freedom. The fact that they were able to deliver that entire thing at the end without her using the word freedom, without anybody saying the word freedom and watching that absolute come down to the difference between being in control and having your authority is the freedom to be. And that's really all that this is about. Your freedom to be. And when we're not. Concept is the freedom to be. And identity 100% is who determines, decides, and conducts. And everything else caters, bows, and adheres, submits to identity. That's what I learned yesterday. Oh, the cognitive core is equal. All the parts are equal in importance, but she has authority. Authority does not mean you are not equal to. Every foundational needs to hear that line again. Authority does not determine your equality of importance. Authority is the one who gets to exercise the freedom. It is a delusion to think that you have to be in charge to have freedom. You can, you need authority to have, free, you need freedom to have your authority and you've always had it. It can't be taken away from you. The delusion of submission to another is what encases us, is what enslaves us. It is the delusion that enslaves us. Authority is something that cannot be taken away. It is our God-given right. Sometimes you have to fight because other people suppress. But it's actually always been there. And the question is, are you willing to fight for it? Are you willing to escape for it? Are you willing to claim it or not?
And that's really the determining factor. Authority does not have anything to do with hierarchical importance. It does have everything to do with your freedom. So identity has to be free to do, to be, to want. And that there you go. She, she, she wants. Now, logic and ethic are there to make sure that she's moral. Logic is saying, look, this all has to stay healthy and consistent because a union divided against itself cannot stand. That is the core, core rule here. A union divided against itself cannot stand. Boom, cognitive dissonance, mental illness. So you got to be unanimous. You got to be unanimous. You got to be more unanimous than the 13th Continental Congress. You got to be fucking unanimous. That being said, it has to be ethical. How ethical it's going to be is determined upon your growth and where you are with those 12 ethical stages. Now, to the beliefs. Those beliefs is what keeps getting in the way. The beliefs. Those beliefs, those beliefs are a bastard. Beliefs are composed. of the logical deductions made from what we observe in the physical world and the emotional mental environment of our mental mind, let's say subconscious mind. And I'm going to translate that here for you. What that means is you're positive or you're negative. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? What the subconscious mind does is it takes the emotional energy and combines it with observations, observational data, equal a premise, which we are going to call a belief. That premise is then used to form your conclusion, which we are going to call a perspective. That perspective is now going to determine your behavior. This is where behavior comes from. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, address your li limiting beliefs. Now, I did that at first because that's what everyone said. I really need to not pair it because every time I pair it, it fucks me up. So I did that. I did what everybody else was doing and I was bullying my subconscious mind into submission by forcing my beliefs. Subconscious mind does not work like that because freedom identity says so. We do not like to have our authority compromised and it's logic. So if you want to coerce your logic, <laughs> you're going to have to fight fire with fire. Positive thinking is what needs to be done. You're going to have to change your positive thinking. You're going to have to change your negative thinking over to positive thinking to alter your beliefs because your beliefs are logical conclusions formed by your logic center. You cannot have positive, healthy beliefs and a negative emotional mental environment. You can't. Logic says so. Logic is going to step in and correct it. So yeah, I bullied my logical beliefs. I put them in the place where I wanted them. I cherry picked my beliefs and my negative mindset stepped in and rearranged everything and put it back. So over time, I did the work here and then over time it shifted back. Did the work over time, it shifted back. I'm going, what the fuck is going on? Anna, you haven't done any positive thinking lately. Oh yeah, I haven't. I have neglected that. Yes, yes. I see now where I went wrong. I failed to focus in on the positive thinking because I was positive thinking. 
and I've got my material reality. And that's really it. You have your positive thinking and your material reality. So if your physical reality, and, and it's interesting because my physical reality is not a bad one. My physical reality is fucking awesome. Regarding my partner, it's currently on hold because he's on walkabout. Now, his absence is now leaving an undefined. Undefines are a reality inside logic. And they are something that are constantly overlooked. The undefined in logic is the problem. It's not a problem. It's just the logical mind has to do what the logical mind does, which is to fill in the blank. We cannot have an undefined. The logical mind must fill in the blank. And to do that, it pulls from deductive reasoning. So what it really pulls from is, let's give you the formula, deductive reasoning it's pulling from observation plus the undefined plus, oh, you know what? We're going to do, we're going to go over to math. That's the undefined variable X. So it's the observation plus X plus emotional mental environment. Which is going to give you the premise which is also referred to as the belief, which will be used for your perspective. So observation, undefined X, emotional, mental environment. I feel a sneeze coming and I hate sneezing into the microphone. Less than you hate me sneezing into the microphone. <laughs> so this is happening whether you were aware of it or not. Observation plus X, undefined variable, emotional, mental environment. Now, the question is, can you solve for X? No, you cannot. Sometimes you cannot. It is called inconclusive. And if it is inconclusive, well, your, your logical line is going to fill in the blank. And it uses emotional, mental environment and observation to do so. Emotional, mental environment and observation. So now let's also throw in there the fear of the unknown. <sighs> so annoying, right? You have fear of the unknown and you have an undefined. So your fear system is now going to pipe in. <sighs> Enter the fear system. And that's it right there. Now you got the fear system getting involved. Oh, we have an unknown. No, no. So when you have an undefined, which is common, you're going to have moments where it's undefined, where it's inconclusive. When you start to put together your logical argument and you start to really sort things out, there's another variable here that I have not yet presented, which I'm going to give to you here in a moment, which is going to like blow this thing whole open. So just give me a moment here. I got to give you A and then I will give you B and then you're going to go, oh my God, it's really awesome. So we're going to focus on this first. So this is everything that's happening in your head. This, this is what's happening in your head. Okay. This is what's going on in your head. This is why there's chaos. It is because if you have not organized all of this data through these, through your cognitive core, it's, it's, it's chaos. 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 It's, it's a whole lot of, well, that's over there and that's over there and that, that's just you all over. Quote, unquote. I love that line from. Wizard of Oz. That's just you all over. So you've got your cognitive core and it's all over the place because it's undefined and it's chaos. Once you define it and you start to put these in order, oh, it's going to clean all this up. But there's one particular variable I have not yet disclosed. This will be literally my first time expressing it here. So don't go looking through all my podcasts or any previous material for it. It's not air. I have not yet said this. You have categories. You have categories. There's categories. I'm going to go ahead and try and define all those categories now. The categories are going to matter. The categories. 
you have your cognitive core's beliefs on love and romance. You have your cognitive core's beliefs on your career and your skills and resources. You have your beliefs on the defined or undefined self. You have your categories on politics, ethics, and the environment. You have your category on friendships, community, and family. You have your cognitive core beliefs based off of children and parenting. And you have your beliefs on death, the afterlife, and religion. You have your beliefs based off of the abstract world. These are the categories of your beliefs. This is where, this was the overwhelming part that I had. When I was going through all this, I felt overwhelmed. I don't feel overwhelmed very often. I map the abstract world. I don't feel overwhelmed ever. I have, I need to tell you what I've got because boy, what I've got is amazing. What I have is a fail safe. Here's overwhelm. And I know that emotions are like this, this ray, this, this magnificent expanding ray. So I know that over there at the end of the ray is, is overwhelm. And I have the preliminary emotions prior to overwhelm that I am tuned into. So the minute I start to feel this, I go, oh, no, we're not going over there. <laughs> so I never feel overwhelmed, ever. Because as soon as I feel this emotion, I don't go, to, what is this emotion? What is that emotion? What is emotion X? Emotion X is the feeling of... <laughs> Illogic. <laughs> like I said, I have a fail safe. So every time I feel the slightest bit of illogic, I go, oh no, oh no, 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 we're going to fix that. And I immediately jump into it and I fix it so there's never any overwhelm. Because overwhelm is when it's so illogical that it doesn't make sense. I, I never feel overwhelmed. This is why. It's because overwhelm is illogic time multiplied. It's multiplied illogic. I never feel overwhelmed. I felt overwhelmed last night when I went, all right, it's time to organize my beliefs. Ah! <laughs> that was the first clue that I had neglected this area of my cognitive core. I felt overwhelmed when I looked at all of my beliefs. I just went, ah! But I know logic. So I was able to go, all right, we're going to clean up this mess. Logic is the organization of chaos. <laughs> so logic is, I'm, I'm going to like put that over here on my TikTok. Logic is da, 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 the organization of chaos. So this is my deep, dark, dirty secret that no one knows. I have OCD. I truly do. I have OCD. But my OCD is manifested in a very unusual way that a lot of people do not realize is actually OCD. And that is illogical chaos. I can't. It's an extraordinary OCD. My OCD is literally illogical chaos. Obsessive 
compulsive. No. I I I I, I would say Do I want to cure this? It is about control. I know this. Is it about freedom? Oh, fuck yes. It's always about freedom. And I exercise control over my freedom through logical order. Logical order. Because the way I was abused, if I was not logical, the price was high. So I have this OCD in my brain of illogical chaos equals rape. Bottom line. So now I am fucking obsessed with, oh, so logical order equals freedom. So when I have anything around me that's illogical, I got to clean it. I got to fix it. I got to fix it. I can't not fix it. There are illogical fallacies all over physics right now, and I'm twitching. I'm twitching bad. I'm going, this is what this is what this is what this is. So my OCD is going nuts over physics right now. And I want to do this. It, it, I see the benefit. The problem is I see the benefit. And what I've done is I've directed it into something productive. So, and this is really it. Does it cure it if you redirect it? Well, and I also have, this is ADHD. This is, this is also my ADHD. This is my neurodivergent mind. This is my mania that people were like, oh, you're manic. Oh, fuck you. I just function at a higher frequency. Thank you very much. So I've got an infinite amount of work that I will always have for all of my life and eternity is figuring out all of education, the life, the universe, and everything, and fixing it. So it's simple. It's, it's very simple to me. It's, oh, I'm just going to master math, logic, physics. Well, logic is old hat for me. So I'm going to master math, physics, astronomy, chemistry. Those are my next. And I'm just going to fix them. Like I fix psychology. Well, this is actually what happened. This was my, my psychological obsession was it's all illogical. And it's, I walked into it and I went, oh my God, the chaos. And I fixed it. And now it makes sense, which is how I did all of this is it's literally my OCD purposely redirected with my ADHD manic neurodivergent into this because I cannot have logical chaos. I can't. I am one of those persons where I have to have the riddle. I have to have the answer to the riddle. 30 years of me trying to find the answer to the riddle. I don't eat. I don't sleep sometimes. I had it down to three hours a night. I was sleeping and I would skip. I would skip meals for like two weeks. Yeah, I have OCD. I just hit it real well. <laughs> and as a result, it's this is my obsession. And my partner did not make logical sense because his brain is bigger than mine. So he was an anomaly to me. So I gotta I I I have to comprehend it. I have to understand that that is my OCD. I have to understand. Some people go around touching things, counting things. I have to understand it. So Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if I want to cure this. I I wouldn't say it's my, it's obstructing my life. I would say it is my life. And because it's productive, it's fine. Yeah. I, 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 I have a lot of my, my, my people are all talking right now. I got my identity going, yeah, what's wrong with it? It's fine. And my logic is saying things like, you realize it's an emotional prosthetic. I know it's an emotional prosthetic. That is exactly what this is. My logic is an emotional prosthetic. But do I want to get rid of it? I mean, look at how beneficial this is. So I have a rare case where it's actually highly beneficial. Does it obstruct my day-to-day life? Well, this is my life. So ethically, ethically, oh, ethically, it's doing a lot for the world. So, oh, yeah. All right. So beliefs. I don't believe there's anything wrong with it. You see how I do this? It's checking in with everybody. I don't believe there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, so it's unanimous. It stays. Yeah, but it's not healthy. Oh, there's the kicks. That's it right there. It's not. It's it's not healthy. That does contradict my ethics. It has to be healthy. Shit. This is how it's done. 
So it's not healthy. Damn it. I'm going to have to figure out the cure. But I want it, says identity. <laughs> so <laughs> this is self-aware. This is what self-awareness looks like. So the categories to all of this, the categories are like, it's overwhelming to categorize all of this. It, it's, it's the categories that allow me to put it in perspective so I can go, oh, okay, the overwhelm is gone. As soon as I put categories in, immediately the overwhelm is gone. Um, so you're going to need to ask your questions. What are your beliefs in love and romance? When you ask this question, you are really focusing, excuse me, you are really focusing on the point of relativity. And we are going to need to get into physics in order to understand the point of relativity. Do, 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 do. Compliments of Einstein. Point of relativity. Da, 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 da. Point of relativity. Boop. The theory of, it's not a theory. The special theory of relativity. What the fuck is this? Okay. The special, where am I? Where am I? What am I on? Okay. So this is Einstein's theory of relativity, which is absolutely a solid because everything is relative to a certain point. The special theory of relativity was based on two main postulates. First, that the speed of light is constant for all observers. And second, that observers moving at constant speed. Okay. This needs to like move out of. Mm, all right. Let's go over to Newton. Go oh, relativity according to Newton. I love you, Einstein, but I think you are motion of bodies, including a given space, are the same among themselves, whether that space is at rest or moves uniformly in a straight line. Okay, Newton's theory of relativity. Let's try Newton. Uh, oh, it's an abstract. Wait a minute. I know that he did not write this abstract. What the fuck? What the fuck? No, Aunt Newton did not write abstracts. All right, I'm just going to go with this for a minute. Abstract. Newton's metaphysical picture of space and time provides the conceptual background of this theory of motion. Philosophical discussion of absolute space and time, however, underemphasized Newton's concern with the relativity of motion. From a modern perspective, this is usually seeing... See, that's not perspective. From a modern point of view. See, this is why words matter. From a modern point of view, this is usually seen as a concern that Newton himself did not... Perspective. Perspective, yeah. Point of view and perspective, are they the same thing? Because I'm thinking dimension, so just give me a minute. Perspective. Does perspective mean point of view? No. No. Because I am in the second perspective of the second point of view. I can have the same perspective of a different point of view. The point of view is first, second, third, and omniscient. But you can have 12 different perspectives within that single point of view. Perspective is the relationship from where you are standing in relationship to. But you can be within the point of the point of view and have 12 different perspectives within that point of view. You can be on the first person point of view, which puts you in relativity to the point. You have point, you have relativity, second person relativity, you have third person relativity. So point of view is relativity, your relationship to. Point of view is your relativity to something. That is point of view. There, that's it. But perspective is your view within that point of view. The perspective is inside the point of view. Really, truly, your perspective, because you can have thousands of perspectives inside a single point of view. If you are in the first person point of view, you could have 12 variations of the same point of view. Perspective is not the same thing as point of view, not at all. This is where I'm just like, come on, we need these more precise. From a modern perspective, this is usually seen as a concern that Newton himself did not take seriously enough, especially in comparison to take seriously enough. That's not how I would word that. Not at all. I'm thinking that he did not dissect it closely enough. Completely different. Like, there's beliefs. It's over there. Am I taking it seriously? Oh, I'm taking those things seriously. But am I dissecting them? Am I taking a closer look? Words matter. 
especially in comparison with contemporaries such as Huygens and Leibniz. In one sense, however, Newton pursued the relative of motion further. Why is there nothing here on the point of relativity? Is it not? Of course, it's defined. Physics would not exist as it exists without defining the point of relativity. Okay, so I'm not finding. One cannot define location without and or unless they have a defined reference point. Bottom line, you cannot define location. You cannot define anything without a starting point with which to measure. Now, I don't know where that is in mathematics, logic, and or physics. It's kind of like a known, it's, 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 it's an unspoken known. Everyone knows it. Whenever we go over, over graphs in mathematics, you have to have your X to Y. You can't just say, okay, X. Well, X is what to what? T to what? You can't just say it's 924 AM, January 16th. Every time you read the calendar or the clock, you are comparing where you are in relationship to the Big Bang. Without the Big Bang, it's irrelevant. All definition, everything that is defined must have a single defined point with which to compare it to. It is the point of comparison. And without it, you're lost. You have no idea where you are. That's why you need a longitude and a latitude. But there's a third point. It's called Earth. Because if I say longitude, latitude, okay, great. Now, where are we talking about? Mars? You need three points. Not two. You must have three. You must have three. You have Earth. Brooklyn, okay, there's your longitude, latitude, and now you have time. You have to have longitude, you have to have latitude, and you have to, you could say that that is the third dimension. One moment. No, because point, a single point, a single point requires two locations, but you need three points to give you third dimension. There's something illogical here. My, my illogic radar is screaming right now. Three points it's saying, no, you need three points to get one single location. Longitude, latitude, earth. There's your three points to give you location. So location is defined by three points. Longitude, latitude, earth. That gives you location, physical location. But it doesn't say when in relationship to the Big Bang. Okay, so physical location requires three points. Longitude, latitude, time. Or lo longitude, latitude, earth. Now, that's your coordinates. Same thing with time. You have the point of relativity to the Big Bang. And by the way, in the physical location of longitude, latitude, Earth, you're comparing it to the sun. It's the sun is the primary point in relationship to the sun. That doesn't move, except it moves away from the Big Bang. So you have Earth in rel relative to the Big Bang. Or you have Mars in relative to the Big Bang. Or I'm sorry, the Sun. Or you have Jupiter 
in relativity to the sun. So that's location. Your primary relative, your point of relativity in location is the sun. Point of relativity. Now with time, it's the Big Bang. But with the third dimension, it's the physical plane. It's the physical I pull out my triangle, my philosopher's compass again. So it's longitude, latitude, earth, and gives you that point. And then with the Big Bang, it gives you calendar, clock, You need a third. Where's the third? Okay, we're going to put that as undefined X. And then with the physical, more logic. Is it the perspective? Era? No. Yes. No. Era. It's the ACBC. It's the common era, before era, BCE or CE. Era, era, that's it, it's the era. Because if I say January 16th, 2024, well, is that before or after? 9.29 a.m., oh, that's so, so random. I would, I would have to say it's the era. You need the era, you need the clock, and you need the calendar. Is the calendar the same as the era? No, oh, fuck no. We already established that. That's why we have CE and BCE. There it is. All right, there it is. Okay, so it's era. And again, this is all in relativity to the Big Bang. The point of relativity for time is the Big Bang. The point of relativity for location is the sun. And the point of the third dimension perspective, the abstract world, is time. No, it's not. What is the point of relativity? The self. Because that is defined first is the self. It's the self. Hi, it's the self. Yeah, it's the self. It's the self. Holy shit, that's fucking awesome. The self is the third dimension. We are the third dimension. Yes. So it would be the self. Well, wow, that's deep. Just give me a minute because I'm, I'm going over all of my Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle now and Pythagoras. Give me a minute. I got to go back to my classic Greek philosophers. Well, in Pythagoras. Let me think here for a minute. Holy fucking shit. The self is the point of relativity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The self in comparison to, and it's the point. Basically, it's the distance. That's what you're looking at is it's the distance. The distance between point A and point B. That is the point of relativity. So if you want to measure every time, every time you are measuring location or dimension, anytime you are measuring dimension, you are measuring distance, lo uh, distance, literally. 100% distance between two points. But you need three points. Why do I? Oh, I'm so sick of this part. This, this is the part where it's frustrating for me because logically it's going, no, you need three parts. You need three points. And I'm going, why? Three points is best. Three points is best to determine coordinates. And I'm going, why? Why? And it's logically there, but I don't know the theory yet because do any three points define a coordinate system? Yes. Origin. <laughs> Origin. Zaxis and Yaxis. I have no idea how to pronounce this word. Two points define a line. Three points a plane. There you go. There you go. Oh, see, now I understand that part. The plane of existence. Three points 
the finer plane. The self. Oh, 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 there it is. Okay, see, now it's coming full circle. Now it's coming full circle. Okay, this is geometry. Oh, this is geometry I've been doing. Like I said, I see the logic. Okay, so you feel it first. This is this is the this is how you do shit. You feel it first. And then you define it using logic. And then you prove it. I am in the proving it stage. The proof is the conglomerate of the logic. But the feeling is what gives it to you first. So I feel shit. And then I deduce shit through definition and logic. And then I prove it with geometry, math, and physics. So what is this? It's a coordinate system, which is what I've said. This is why I call it the philosopher's compass. There you go. So you need to define a coordinate system. You need the origin. And then you need the this word that I can't pronounce, X-A-X-I-S. And then you need the yaxis. What the fuck is, I don't want to be on Quora, but I definitely want this word. Let me go define these, these words. Wait a minute. It's just an X axis and a Y axis. They're hyphenated. Oh, the, the people in the thing did not. So it's an X and a Y. So you need origin X, Y. That makes a lot more sense. The Cardissian, Cartesian coordinate system. What is this? When things are logical, you do not need the origin to define them. You just need logic. Logic bypasses education every time. Because logic will get you to the same point regardless. This is why logic is so good. A Cartesian coordinate system in two dimensions, also called a... What did it just say, people? A Cartesian coordinate system in two dimensions, also called a rectangular coordinate system or an orthogonal, is defined by an ordained, ordered pair of perpendicular lines, axes, and a single unit of length for both axes and an orientation for each axis. The point where the axes meet is taken as the origin for both, thus turning in each axis into a number line for any point P. So basically it's lines. It's, it's your A to B. You could look, you could use plane. The three dimensions, however, this is my world. Three dimensional space requires three coordinates. This is what I'm saying. Everyone's walking around talking about dimensions without taking into account the Cartesian coordinate system at all. And it's driving me crazy. And I'm going, we are not walking into the third and the fourth dimension. People, you need to take into the Cartesian coordinate system. It's right here, defined in three-dimensional space. If you do not have a point of relativity and you only have an X, then where are you getting this third dimension from your ass? Come on. Oh, this makes so much more sense. Okay, so the Cartesian coordinate system. But you need geometry, which, yeah, coordinate system. Yeah, there you go. So this is your point of relativity. Yeah, you, you must have a point of relativity in order to define your X and your Y. When you have a graph, you are just talking about your X and your Y, which is why I'm sitting here screaming, we are not in the third dimension going into the fourth. That is ludicrous. We are in the first dimension. For three-dimensional systems, a convention is portrayed of the XY horizontally. See, hypothetically, it's on paper, but that's not how it is in relativity too. The four quadrants of a Cartesian coordinate system. This is my world. This is my language. Oh my God. Oh, I'm in Euclidean geometry. Oh yes, I just found home. Okay, so I have my point of relativity. My brain functions, lives, guides, dreams in the Euclidean geometry system. That explains so much. Like I said, I just didn't have it defined. I could feel it, so I use logic to be there, but now I'm defining it. Euclidean geometry. Now I need that. I knew it was in Euclidean. Oh, Pythagorean. Pythagoras. We're back to you again. This is how I came up with my, so my philosopher's compass was, de was designed off of the logic of the three-point system. It's like, and I have something called combination theory, which is actually, which is coordinates. And this is what I say in one of my earlier articles is you need 
three perspectives. This is what's going on is a person will have you, you have three perspectives to make up your whole perspective. You have your ethical perspective. You have your subconscious mind, your logical perspective. Oh, look at that. Subconscious mind is logic. There we go. All this time that I've been saying subconscious, I say I called it authority and I knew that didn't feel right. And now I understand why. I have authority, says identity. Yes, you do. The subconscious mind has your logic. That's what it is. It's your logical system. Your subconscious mind is your logical system. There you go. It's your subconscious logic. Bum, bum. There it is. It is defined. I love defining shit. This is why I lucid dream. So your subconscious mind is logic. And yes, it is so deeply ingrained into us that it is there naturally. And that is referred to as our intuition. That is when we are using our gut to logically deduce. Logical deduction is our intuition. And she's the one who says, do this, go there, be there. No, you got to keep that door open because he's going to come back. All right, fine. But it's identity who's screaming, I want. So, so there's identity with her freedom. Woohoo. And, and then you've got this logic that's just guiding the now. So the logic of now. And then you have the logic of future, which is intuition. The logic of now is defined by your ethics and your beliefs, which are accumulated from your emotions and your observations. Oh, I love, see, see, and I have a whole lot of, yes, everything now makes sense and there's calm. Woohoo! So I have, yes, yes, everything is calm now. Everything, there, is, there is order again. I can relax. So you have your identity freedom. You've got your logical now of ethics, emotions, and observations. And then you've got your intuition gut. And hope, hope, hope needs to be in here. Hope is here. Thank you. And then you've got your intuition gut, which is your logical deduction for your future. There, there, this is all making sense now. Now, when you sit down with your, with your perspectives, you have your ethical perspective, your logical perspective, and your environmental perspective. And those are your three points of perspective. Now, to determine your alignment is going to determine who and what you are based off of these three ethics. So for instance, if you are a six ethical perspective, but logically, because of trauma, you are at a two ethical perspective and your environment is a four ethical perspective, your combination is now six, two, four. Those are your coordinates and they are not aligned. Now you're going to have cognitive dissonance because you need to be at a six, six, six. You must be aligned. If you are a fifth perspective, you have to have five, five, five. If you are a second perspective, you have to have two, two, two. Here's the problem with two, two, twos. There's a lot of people who are in denial where they think they're a two when in fact they are fucking terrified of contradicting God, fear of God, mother, or the family. So you have a lot of twos who are adamant that they're twos because they are fucking terrified of the fear of God. They are fucking terrified of God. That fear of God now interferes with your truth. Are you really a two? Or do you just have the fear of God instilled into you? And that's really a big question for the twos. That is the trial that the twos have to pass. Are you really a son of God? Or are you just that fucking afraid? You don't know because freedom, you don't know what you really feel if you're not afraid. If fear is part of the equation, that's not identity at all because identity is void of fear because the opposite of fear is love. Boom, so says God. Which is it? There is nothing more disgusting than the fear of God. It's a fucking illogical contradiction. Like bad teacher. Like, oh, fear of God and bad teacher. Could anything be more illogical? God is love. Then why would you fear love? Does that make sense to you? So the second perspectives have a lot that they have to overcome. Starting right off with the fact of, 
Are you there because you're afraid or are you there because you really do love God? And every second perspective is going to go, oh, no, I really love God. Well, how do you know that if you're afraid of him? Because that's not freedom. That is fear ordained. Now you're getting into an emotional prosthetic. You have to face your fear, which is facing down with your God. It's going to be you versus God, you versus your faith. I've walked this road. I was a devout Christian until I said, I love you so much, God, that I have so much faith in you that no matter how much logic I study, no matter how much philosophy I delve into, no matter how much I can logically prove and get into the world of science, it will bring me back to you. Yeah, I'm challenging you, I said to God, and I did. And I believe that God wants nourishes, flourishes, flourishes, thrives in education. I believe truly because if he did not want, then he would not have given. The fact that I had curiosity, the fact that I desired and wanted education, that's God given. Therefore, he wants me to pursue education. And if that means questioning his very existence, I believe a God loves you so much that he would allow that, nurture it, encourage it. Because I, as a parent, very much want my children to challenge me. Because the only time we do not challenge our authorities is the abusers who want to keep it. This all comes down to freedom. Again. So you want to know if you truly love God? Challenge the fear of him. Challenge him. See where it takes you. Because you cannot have love for God and fear of him at the same time. Your ethical, logical environment. Is. That four, the environment at that at the end of it is the four. If you have a, an individual in your household who governs your family environment and they dictate at a four, but you are a six, you're going to have conflict. And it's the alignment that allows us to break free from cognitive dissonance. We covered a lot today, a lot. I have a worksheet. Let me go ahead and it definitely needs to be cleaned up. But this worksheet is going to be basically breaking down. Let me just take a look down here at the beliefs. So your beliefs, point of relativity. And I'm going to ref refer to the Cartesian mm, coordinate system here. The point of relativity is the Cartesian coordinate system. And when you have that, um, it's literally going through of you're going to want to ask the questions, what are your beliefs? regarding love and romance. And this is where it's going to be some substantial, substantial questions. You have to define, and, and that's just it. You will have to define each belief. The next thing outside of define the belief this is how to do it. You're going to define the belief. This is how you do checks and balances in logic. You are then going to break down the components. This is exactly like reverse mathematics, reverse division. This is like division and multiplication. This is how you do it. Break down the components that form the belief. And it's going to be the event plus the emotion plus one more, one more. All right. Let's use mine as an example. I believe that I cannot have love. True story. Love is not for me. I'm going to cry. This is my core belief here in love and romance. I believe that love is not for me. Why? Evidence. Love doesn't work out for me. Ever. Oh, 
past evidence. Emotion. Pain. And loss. And rejection. Now. Oh. It's the past. Past and present. Oh, oh, there it is. There's the epiphany I've been eating. Equals deductive future. There it is. That's what forms a belief. It's the current situation. Current situation. No partner. No lover. No husband present. Past owners, breakups, losses. Unless they can control me. <laughs> Emotions. Right. Hurt and grief. Conclusion. For the future. I believe love is not something I can have. How would I challenge this thing? Time. I have changed my mental environment. My emotional mental environment. mental illnesses are now absent, are no longer a factor as they once were. You have to challenge the past. You have to challenge past evidence. The past evidence is now invalid. There it is. Because, oh, I see the logical argument already. Because the components of the past that presented scenario X are no longer because the components of the past that presented scenario X are no longer applied to the present scenario. And that's it right there. Past evidence is now invalid. Okay, so here's how it works. Beliefs are formed from past, present, and emotions. And when we combine the three of them, it leads to the future. And that's where a belief comes from. It is a predictor of the future. A belief is a predictor of the future. So when you have past plus emotions plus the present situation, it leads to your decision on what the future is going to be. Now you have a belief. A belief is a predictor of the future. However, it is assuming that the variables, the components that made up the past have not changed. And that's not logical. Right there is a lack of the logic. It is because we are applying a past version of ourself with a present version of the self. It assumes no growth. It assumes no change. Now, this is something in math. Oh, this is definitely something in math. 
It is the rate. Oh, come on, come on. Let me go over to my math studies. Uh... I was doing this the other day. It is, yeah, it's the rate of change. It's the rate of change. We are not taking into account the variable of the rate of change because we lack the third dimension. Yes, there it is. Because we lack the third dimension, we cannot, we, we are missing this vast ball of logic. Holy fucking shit. The 12 ethical stages of perspective growth is the third dimension, is the rate of change. And because we all lack this knowledge, we don't have that to inter insert into our equation. So what we have instead is my past self is X. Therefore, my present self is X. But now you enter the third dimension of perspective growth into this. And now you have the variable, the rate of growth and change, which will correct the logic. See, I would, I, when I went into therapy, there was that, this is an argument that my, that my uh, therapist presented to me. Do you don't think you can grow? She didn't say those words. She, because she didn't have the vocabulary, because she did not have this dimension to plug in. So it was constantly a, you think you're X, therefore you are still X. Because you need the defined rate of growth to determine that, which until now has been missing. Here you go. Boof, there it is. Now take into account the 12 ethical stages of growth. Are you the same individual? It now invalidates your present self of X so that now the present self of X is no longer X. X is now Y. So you have two variables. This is the mathematical piece that was lacking from the logical equation, which is why we kept having illogical, toxic, misleading beliefs. Because beliefs are accumulated from the past self X and the emotions. But now it presents the present self of Y. And now the past self is no longer applicable. You now can only use, and same thing with emotion from past X. So now memory is obsolete. It completely cancels it out. Therefore, beliefs are now based off of present Y with the tradition of the rate of growth, which is your 12th ethical perspective. It replaces... Because you need coordinates. You need three pieces. It used to be past X with emotions of X with present Y. That's invalid. The new formula, when you have these 12 ethical stages, is the ethical Y with emotional Y for the present why? Instead of basing it off of past experience with emotions, you need to base it off of your ethical present, your ethical present with your emotional present. There's the cognitive dissonance. We were comparing the present. Okay. Assume that present is Y and past is X. Okay. X equals past and Y equals present. What we were doing was this. We had Past X with emotion X with present Y, cognitive dissonance, because we now have the rate of ethical change, which is now ethical Y present, which is changing because it's based off of the ethics that grow. Our growth is what was never taken into account. Our growth is the ethical variable that we were missing, that third dimension. I feel so happy right now. All right. So when you are forming your beliefs, you need to base them off of your ethical why and your emotional why and your present why. Your present situation, and it's situation. It really needs to be the situation, the current situation why. So you would take current situation, which is why, 
your past situation, which is X, and your emotions from X. That was illogical. Add in the rate of growth, and now you have your ethical, cur your current ethics with your rate of growth, your emotions, current situation Y, with your present Y, which now means you have to change your positive thinking. Hope is growth. Hope is growth. Hope comes from growth. Learning perspective. Hope comes from the learning perspective. Hope is learning. Hope is growth. That's what it is. Change gives us hope. If you have trauma with learning, yesterday's video. No, I'm sorry, two videos ago. If you have trauma with learning, I cover this a lot. The worksheet is going to be available on my website. Um, it also is going to be included with my workbook coming up called The Journey into the Self. Uh, I have two books that I am working on. I have The Theory of Love, and I also have Journey into the Self. Journey into the Self is going to be the workbook that complements the Theory of Love. Theory of Love is the conclusive, the, the entire accumulation of my work. I have a lot to digest today. Thank you so much for your audience and may the kindest of words always find you.